Hello, chemistry students. In this video, we're going to talk about hybridization theory and how to determine the hybridization of a molecule based on its electron pair geometry or its electron geometry. So we learned earlier that from the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, that molecules spread out to minimize repulsion between atoms and lone pairs. We learned earlier that in the electron geometry, if there are two electron groups, sometimes referred to as electron domains, we create a linear geometry with a bond angle of 180 degrees to keep the two electron groups or domains as far away as possible. We also learned if there were three electron groups that the electron geometry was trigonal planar, giving us a bond angle of 120. If there was four electron groups, tetrahedral, bond angle of 109.5. If we were able to expand the octets and have five electron groups or domains, we would have the angles of 90 and 120, 120 being the angle for the equatorial position and 90 being for the domains in the axial position. If there were six electron groups or domains, that would give us uh, electron geometry of octahedral, where all of them would be at 90 degrees. So if you only want to know what you need to know for hybridization theory, it's right here in this table. Based on the electron geometry, you could just memorize the hybridization quite easily. So two domains or two groups is an SP hybridization. What that means is you take one S orbital and blend it with one P orbital in the central atom. If there are three electron groups or domain, that would be a hybridization of sp2, meaning you would take one s orbital and two p orbitals, blend them and make three equivalent sp2 hybridized orbitals. Four electron groups would give me sp3, five would give me an sp3d. So to have five electron domains, you have to expand the octet. That's why this can only occur in the third energy level or beyond when the central atom has that additional D sublevel, because that would be an sp3D hybridized hybridization. You would need that D orbital to hybridize and blend. If there are six domains, again, I'm expanding the octet. I'd have to have the central atom, the third uh, principal energy level or beyond, and then I would get a sp3d2 hybridization. So again, if you want to know what, you're done. That's all you need to know. You could look at the electron geometry, the electron pair geometry, and then tell me the hybridization as simple as that. So the rest of this is geared towards why. So let's look at the tetrahedral arrangement. So with methane, we see that there are four electron groups. What do I mean by electron groups? Well, in earlier videos, I mentioned that you can think of electron groups as either lone pairs and or atoms, okay? So that's the easiest thing because these are the things that are gonna repel each other and wanna spread out and maximize the bond angle. So in methane, I have one, two, three, four atoms. I want to spread them as far away apart as possible. I get a 109.5 degree angle, and this is an electron geometry of tetrahedral. So there are four electron groups on carbon. Why? There's four atoms. So this would be an sp3 hybridization. Why? I need to blend three orbitals, one s and three p's. That's why I get the P3. So this would be considered four hybridized orbitals. How come? Well, with carbon, if I look at the atomic orbitals, and really this atomic orbital diagram isn't really a true representation as far as energy, because if energy is increasing as I go up, 
we know that there is a splitting with multi-electron species where I would have 2s and the 2p's would be slightly higher. And we know that carbon has four valence electrons because it's in the group 4a and it would have one, two, and then three, four valence electrons. If I look at the atomic orbital diagram of carbon, it makes, doesn't make sense that I have four equivalent bonds because really I only have two orbitals that are unpaired. So how is it that I get four equivalent bonds? Hybridization. The 1s orbital and the 3p orbitals actually hybridize to create a lower energy level of four equivalent orbitals. Those four equivalent orbitals are one of the s's and the 3p's making a completely new orbital with a new shape, which is referred to as the sp3 hybrid orbitals. So we can see that there's a blending where the shape takes on kind of uh, not quite a bilobal shape, but an enlarged greater domain of electron probability. So when we look at this uh, tetrahedron, we're seeing the electron domain region where there is the greatest probability of finding the electron. You can think of it as here is one electron that's unpaired, here's another electron, here's another electron, and there's another electron. And these are my four equivalent sp3 hybridized orbitals, all with the same energy. They're slightly higher in energy than the 2s, but lower than the 2p. And that creates four equivalent orbitals. And again, four electron groups. Why? There's four atoms. What is their hybridization? sp3 hybridization. Why? Four groups. We need one of the s's and three of the p's. So we have four hybridized orbitals. Now, we're going to learn in this case, because these are what used to be referred to as single bonds, they're actually called sigma bonds. So I have four sigma bonds here, and there are four hybridized bonds. So let's talk a little more about hybridization. Why does it occur? Well, it's a way to maximize bonding and make things more stable for the central atom. So more bonds, more full or orbitals, more stability. It's a blending of the different types of atomic orbitals to make new degenerate orbitals. What I mean by degenerate, they are the same in energy, just like those four sp3 orbitals. But I don't have to hybridize just four, right? I can hybridize two or three or four or five or six, giving me those different electron geometries based on the electron groups and domains. This being linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, and octahedral. So the same type of atom can also have different hybridization. So we just saw carbon having a tetrahedral hybridization, giving me an sp3 hybridized orbital, but carbon can also have an sp or an sp2. It cannot have the sp3d and sp3d2 because it is in the second energy level and it doesn't have a d sublevel. Remember, that requirement of expanding the octet means the central atom has to be in the third energy level or beyond. So now we need to talk about the different types of bonds because previously we learned single, double, triple. Well, that's not exactly true. Sigma bonds are basically where atomic orbitals that have hybridized have a direct overlap between the two nuclei. So that looks like this. A sigma bond is a direct overlap. So you can think of this as maybe this is a carbon atom, this is another. When they come close enough, they have what is called a internuclear overlap, which we call a sigma bond. A sigma bond, you have to know, is hybridized. So what is a double or a triple bond? Really, to have a double or a triple, you first have to have a single bond or really the sigma. And then the additional bonding orbitals are what we refer to as pi bonds. 
pi bonds are not direct overlap. They're rather parallel or perpendicular to the sigma bonds. So that would look something like this. That is an unhybridized orbital. It's unhybridized. So if this was carbon and this was carbon, to have this pi bond due to this parallel overlap, I would first have to have a sigma bond with a direct overlap like this. You cannot have a pi bond unless there is a sigma. If you have a single bond, that's one sigma. If you have a double bond, that's one sigma and one pi. If you have a triple bond, that is one sigma and two pi. The pi's are unhybridized and they are parallel to the direct internuclear overlap in the hybridized sigma bonds. That you need to know. So let's go back to electron group geometries and domains. It all starts with Lewis structure. If you can't draw the Lewis structure, you're not gonna be able to determine the molecular geometry and then the hybridization is gonna be tricky. If you know the correct Lewis structure and the molecular geometry, you could go back to that first video and based on that, for, I'm sorry, that first slide and you would know the hybridization. So the correct Lewis structure is gonna tell us how many sigma and pi bonds there are around the central atom. So we take a look here. So the first thing we need to do is each bond is considered one group, okay? So it doesn't matter if it's a single, a double, or a triple. So each atom is an electron group, but also each lone pair is an electron group. And a lone pair is also a hybridized orbital. So when I look at this nitrogen dioxide, how many groups do I have? Well, there are three electron groups on this nitrogen. Why? There is one, two oxygen atoms, and there is one lone pair. So that is a total of three groups. So that is an sp2 hybridization. Why? It's electron geometry is trigonal planar. One for the lone pair and two for the two oxygen atoms. Now this has one lone pair, which is the hybridized orbital, and it has two sigma bonds. So remember, to be bound, you have to have a direct overlap. So here's one sigma, and we could say that this is another sigma. So I have two sigmas, and one lone pair, sp2 hybridization. So what is the other bond I see? The other bond is a, what we used to call double bonds, right? So this is a double, it's really one sigma and one pi. So there is one pi bond that is unhybridized. So let's look at another geometry, linear geometry. Let's look at CO2. It has two electron groups, why? What do we say electron groups were? Atoms or lone pairs. It has two atoms attached to the central atom carbon. So because there are two domains or two groups on carbon, it's sp hybridized. That means I had to hybridize one s orbital and one p because there's two electron groups. There's two sigma bonds and they're hybridized orbitals. But we also know that these bonds are double, right? So what does that mean? I have two sigma, but I also have two pi. Because remember, for every double bond, there's one sigma, one pi. So we could say, this is a sigma, and then that's a pi. This is a sigma, and there, that's a pi. So what does that look like if we're looking in terms of hybridization? So I know that carbon as a central atom has four valence electrons. So I'm saying that the linear geometry gives me a sp hybridization because there's two groups around it. So it's giving me two sp orbitals, right? And that's my direct 
overlap. So here's carbon, a direct overlap, a direct overlap. But realize that of the four valence electrons, two went into the two sp, two were left unhybridized, and those two left unhybridized resulted in the parallel overlap with the oxygens. Now, you guys don't have to draw this, but you can think of it as instead of a direct internuclear overlap, it's parallel. So here's one pi. Now, it's really hard to draw uh, in 3D, but the other pi would be behind the plane and in front of the plane, and it would match up with one of the oxygens this way, and I'd have it bonding that way. So that would result. And again, two electron groups, two oxygen atoms, sp hybridization, two sigma bonds, but then there's two pi bonds that are unhybridized. And those would combine with unhybridized p orbitals on the oxygen. What about formaldehyde, which is trigonal planar? It has three electron groups. Why? There's three atoms. So, Three electron groups, it's trigonal planar. It's an sp2 hybridization. Three sigma bonds, three hybridized orbitals, and one pi bond. So we have a sigma bond here, here, and here. And then we have the one pi bond, which is unhybridized. Remember, a double bond is one sigma and one pi. So what would that look like? Well. You can think of it, again, carbon has four valence electrons. There's three atoms, so three sigma bonds. And then there was one pi bond, one hybridized, unhybridized p orbital. So this is how we create the three equivalent bonds, the sp2 hybridized. We take one s and two p's, make three equivalent bonds. And then we have the pi bond, which is the unhybridized which is above and below the plane. So three electron groups, sp2 hybridization, three sigma bonds, and one pi bond, unhybridized. What about ammonia? Ammonia has four electron groups. How come? Again, it has three atoms, but it also has a lone pair. Remember, lone pairs count as electron groups. So it has four electron groups. SP3 hybridized. Three sigma bonds. How do we know? One, two, three, and one lone pair. The lone pair is a hybridized orbital. You could think of it as we know that nitrogen, if we look at its valence shell, it's group 5A, is a 2s2, 2p3. But when I hybridize it, I get four, one, two, three, four sp3s. And remember, I have five valence electrons. So that's one, two, three, four, five. There's my lone pair. And those are my three unpaired sigma bonds that will have the direct internuclear overlap. What about water? Well, water has how many groups? Four groups, two lone pairs and two atoms. So this is considered an sp3 hybridization. Two sigma bonds, two lone pairs. What happens when I expand octets? So when I expand octets, like in the case of phosphorus pentachloride, the first thing you have to realize is the central atom, phosphorus, is in the third principal energy level. So what does that mean? It can expand its octet. That's why we can have five electron groups. Why? Five bonds. So five electron groups on phosphorus. What does that mean? Five hybridized orbitals. Sp3 would only be four, so I need the D sublevel, and I hybridize one of the D, empty D, uh, sublevel orbitals to make five equivalent orbitals. So I have five sigma bonds, sp3d hybridization. So what do I do? Again, I have five valence electrons, four phosphorus, because it's in group 5a. I take 
the one three S because that's my Phelan shell, the three three P's and one of the empty three D's and create five equivalent orbitals. And then my five valence electrons, one, two, three, four, five, allow for five equivalent bonds. And that's why we get this trigonal bipyramidal shape, spreading them out. And I get this um, sp3d2 hybridization, or sp3d, I'm sorry, sp3d. So there are five electron groups, sp3d hybridization, because five sigma bonds. Now, again, when we look at electron groups, it doesn't always have to be an atom. It could be lone pair. So in this case, where we have sulfur tetrafluoride, we see that one of the groups is a lone pair in the equatorial position. So it's still an electron geometry of trigonal bipyramidal, although we know that the molecular geometry is called seesaw because we're ignoring that when we call the name but it's still five electron groups on the central atom. The difference is, even though it's sp3d hybridized, we only have four sigma bonds, one, two, three, four, because again, four atoms, to have four atoms attached, we have to have a direct internuclear overlap, which is a sigma bond, and then the other hybridized orbital is the one lone pair. So if we look at bromine trifluoride, again, we have five domains, one, two, three, four, five, or five group, electron groups, two are lone pairs, three are bonds. So five electron groups, sp3d hybridization, three sigma bonds, two lone pairs. We go to sulfur hexafluoride, now we have six bonds. Again, these are going to be sigma bonds. So six electron groups, sp3d2 hybridization, because I need to have a total of six equivalent orbitals, hybridized orbitals. So I get six sigma bonds, and they're all hybridized. And that looks like this. And remember, sulfur is in group 6a, so it has six valence electrons so we get one two three four five six so we have six <clears throat> unpaired electrons in six degenerate <clears throat> orbitals that we call sp3d2 the reason why we're able to use the empty d sublevel here is because sulfur is in the third energy level and then we make six equivalent hybridized orbitals that can create sigma bonds because again, we would to bond these atoms require a direct internuclear overlap. So there are six electron groups, sp3d2 hybridized, six sigma bonds. So bromine tetrafluoride, still six groups. However, one of the groups is a lone pair. The other five are atoms. So there are six electron groups, sp3d2 hybridization. You got five sigma bonds and one lone pair. So just as a review, how can you determine the hybridization? How can we determine whether it's sp, sp2, sp3, sp3d, or sp3d2? It's easy. Look at your electron geometry and look at the name of the electron geometry and the number of electron groups or domains attached. So this video is a little longer than some of your other videos, but this is a really important concept, especially if you're moving on to do any type of organic chemistry or biochemistry in the future. And I hope this was helpful and thanks for tuning in.